apologetics as love, not apologetics as debate. So this is not going to be an academic consideration of apologetics. God is love. And that is one of the basic categories of reality in the biblical description of reality. God is love and everything begins with God. So when we present God's truth to people, if we don't do it in love, then we don't do it right. Which doesn't mean they won't be converted because the Holy Spirit is not completely dependent on our expertise, if you see what I mean. So you can do it totally wrong and people might be converted. But we're not working with instrumentalism. We're not working with, if it works, it's good, which is very dangerous because many people were saved in Hitler's concentration camps, which means logically we should have more concentration camps so that more people would be saved. You see, instrumentalism really doesn't work. I'm interested in loving relationships rather than mechanical methodologies or academic expertise. Not that those things are not valuable. They, they are valuable. I mentioned the categories of reality, and that is a, a favorite word of mine. It seems to me that we might say categorics instead of apologetics. Apologetics means to defend, but the Great Commission is not go ye into all the world and defend yourselves. It is go ye into all the world and make disciples. And we are called to love, and love is not defensive. Love is offensive, which means it, it goes out, it's, it's reaching out. In the Greek court system that the word apologetics comes from, you know they had the the accusation, the prosecution, and then the defense. And the, the defense is the apologia. The prosecution is the categoria, which is the presentation of the categories of crime, motive, availability, habeas corpus, eyewitnesses, these kinds of things. Then the apologia is the witnesses were drunk, and I don't know the guy, and uh, you know, these, these kinds of things. And I wasn't there, I was at a party down the street and everybody knows me. So that would, that would be the, the apologia in the, in the court system. So there, there certainly is a place for defending because sometimes people are questioning or attacking. And that comes from the apologetics mantra, which is 1 Peter 3.15. Always be, you could say it with me, Always be prepared to give an answer to those who question the faith that is in you. Okay? That's the first half of the sentence. What's the second half? <laughs> and do this with gentleness and respect. Which is really shocking. Because it means you've got to go out there and respect the Muslims and respect the atheist, and respect the Buddhist, and respect the, the monist. And this is not maybe normally how we think, but it's what Peter says. Gentleness and respect. So I would say, as one of the, the elements of love, is respect. We need to respect the people that we talk to, and they need to sense that we respect them, and that we don't talk down to them that we, we don't approach them as, I'm a Christian, I'm in, you're not a Christian, you're out. I talk to you because I pity you, and you need me. This is not the great <laughs> approach. You know, Jesus Christ died not to make me a Christian, but to make me a human being. Ecce homo, said Pilate, the great, the, one of the several prophecies of Pontius Pilate, ecce homo, behold the man. So he died that I and you could become human, not particularly that we could become 
Christian and live in the Christian tradition and the liturgical tradition and the Christian culture. That's, that would be a secondary thing. The primary thing is that we would become human. Many of the people that you meet who are not Christians in the area of being Christian, you have very little in common with them. But in the area of being a human being, you have very much in common with them. Where should you begin? Should you begin with, I am a Christian, you are not? Or should you begin with, we are both human beings, let's be together? Sorry? Yeah, human, human being. Let's be human beings together and look at reality. What do you think? 1 Peter 3.15 talks about the people who question the faith that is in you. The difficulty is people don't question the faith that is in you. They don't care. <clears throat> They're not interested. So much of the work that we do is pre-apologetics. Because the people have to have questions. They have to know that they are poor in spirit. This is when Jesus gave, gave the great manifesto of the kingdom, the Sermon on the Mount. The first point, the foundation point of the whole manifesto is blessed are the poor in spirit. So if you are poor in spirit, you can be blessed. If you are rich in spirit, you cannot be blessed. And rich in spirit means I know I don't need anything. I have the truth. Or I know there is no truth. Or I know that cynicism is the correct approach to reality. That is rich in spirit. But when we're poor in spirit and we realize we don't know, we need to know, then we can be blessed. Ble what does bless mean? It doesn't mean to say nice things or to pat on the head or something like that. It means to enlarge, to, to make the person bigger. Curse means to shrink. So we bless people, we make them larger, and people can be made larger in their life if they are poor in spirit, and they know they need to be larger. So this knowledge is essential for salvation and human growth and being blessed, and many, many people don't have that knowledge. They don't know that they are poor in spirit. So how do you bless them? You help them to, be, to become aware that they are poor in spirit. And just saying, you are poor in spirit, is maybe not so helpful. They, because they, they, what? <laughs> You're kidding. Uh, no, well, what about you? So it's that it might not be so helpful. When I think of apologetics, I think more of asking questions than giving answers. Because the people don't really have good, poor in spirit questions, which they need. But if I ask them questions, it can stimulate, it can open up windows and doors of perception and help them to find the questions that they need. So I, I would more begin with questioning than proclamation. So 1 Peter 3.15 sort of implies you've made a proclamation. You have said, I personally believe that Jesus is God and was incarnated and rose from the dead and ascended into heaven and is Lord of everything, King of the universe. That is a proclamation. And proclamation is an apologetic tool. It's like a hammer. The difficulty is, to someone with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> But not everything is a nail, you see. Some, and the hammer is not the appropriate tool for every situation. You might need a screwdriver or a saw or sandpaper or a crowbar. And you can imagine how that corresponds to personal relationships. Don't lose your hammer. Keep it. But have other tools in your bag so that when you're in a situation, you don't have your hammer like a gun on your hip, and everyone you see, oh yeah, and that's, that's your only reaction, that's the only tool you have. Have other tools. And 
Uh, something I've noticed over the years is that it is very easy to reject a statement, but it is not easy to reject a question. Sometimes I say, that question is wrong, but it's rare and it's very difficult and most people don't do it. Most people receive the question and process it in some way, but many people are Teflon to statements. They just bounce off. It doesn't have any effect on them at all. But you really get into a person's mind and heart with questions and the possibility of that question becoming their question is very great. And then if it's their question, you have blessed that person. But the possibility of your statement becoming their statement is not so great. It can be more effective to ask questions than to make statements. So uh, I'm thinking of the the categories of the kingdom of God, the categories of the biblical worldview, that when we are salt and light, we should be flavoring and lighting the culture around us by presenting to the world the categories of the kingdom. And the categories of the kingdom are, for instance, reality is both unified and diversified. It is not only unified as in a monistic Hindu-Buddhist yoga uh, worldview. It is also diversified. That would be a major category of the kingdom. A category of the kingdom is human life involves guilt. We are not only victims of reality. We are perpetrators and we are guilty. And forgiveness is possible. That would be a, a major category. Of the, of the kingdom. A category of the kingdom is that reality is basically personal and relational and not mechanical energetic. We don't begin with matter and energy and then personality evolves, which is a very popular category that I'm sure you've all met people who have that category. We begin with personal relational reality and then matter and energy are created. It's the opposite <laughs> direction. So the categories of the kingdom of God can be very, very different from the categories of this world. And, and that's where we want to practice categorics. We want to present the categories, not initially with statements, but with questions. When people have categories that we observe to be unbiblical, false, we need to be asking questions about those categories, like, oh, that's interesting. How does that work? Does it work in all circumstances, or do, does it depend on certain circumstances to be effective? Does it work when you're young and when you're old? Does it work if you're European or Asian or African? Do these categories work in every culture, in every period of history? Are they really universal categories? And then a person has to think, well, what am I talking about? Am I talking about universal categories? Or am I talking about something that I romantically hope in? Am I talking about something that can really be independent? And then another question, especially for postmoderns, is, does that category exist because you choose it and like it and want it? Does that category depend on your giving it authority to shape reality? Or does that category exist before you exist and, you, and we are all confronted with that same category? Do we create our own personal reality with the categories that we feel comfortable with or hopeful about? Or are there categories that are independent of us? Like, for instance, I have often asked people, how do you feel today about gravity? Do you feel that gravity pulls you toward the earth? Or do you feel that gravity pushes you away? Or do you feel that gravity is canceled today? How do you feel about it? 
And of course, some people will actually answer you because this is their normal way of relating to reality. How do I feel about it? Well, I feel a bit negative today about gravity and a bit rebellious. And then you can say, well, do you want to go flying with me? And take them up on top of the roof and say, now we feel that gravity is canceled. Let's go. Well, of course, uh, there, there is a form, there is a category of reality that is independent of my idea and my emotion and my desire and independent of my faith. So I'm often asking Christians, and, but you can apply this kind of question to non-Christians, who is Jesus Christ before you were born? And many Christians are struck down. They only know who Jesus Christ is in terms of themselves. Jesus is the one who loves me. Jesus is the one I love. Jesus is the one who saves me. Jesus is the one who heals me, which is probably all true. But then my question is, if you don't exist, who is Jesus? And I, I asked this question at, at La Brie, and a Norwegian man thought this was not a very useful question. And he's the leader in the International Boy Scout Movement. And he was at a Boy Scout jamboree, and he saw two young Christian guys that were Boy Scouts. And he went to them, and he said, I was just at a conference in England, and I heard a question. Can I ask you this question? And they said, sure. And he said, who was Jesus Christ before you were born? And they both said, well, how should I know? I wasn't born yet. <laughs> <clears throat> and then he went, oh, maybe it is an important question. But you see, it's not, it's not only important for Christians, but for other, other people who, to ask, is this idea uh, there permanently part of reality, or do you invent it? Do you sustain it? Do you give this idea authority, or does it have authority, and then you live in the, in the face of it? That was introductory material. There's more. Then you have these 12 apologetic considerations, suggestions about apologetics, that we could talk about any of them in detail. The first, do not be prejudiced or ridiculing. Do not expect to agree or disagree. And as a corollary to that, I would say, listen louder than you speak. So listen louder than you speak, and then ask many questions, encourage straight and adequate answers. I would say, think things down to the bottom and out to the edges, and invite other people to do that with you. Think thoroughly. Ask the question, so what? Now, if someone tells you, I saw I saw a Chinese guru fly. Okay. Don't doubt that. They may have seen it. I mean, it may have been because they were eating funny mushrooms, or it may be an atmospheric anomaly, but they saw what they saw. Don't doubt it. Don't argue with them that they didn't see it. Ask them, so what? Does that mean your sins are forgiven? Does that mean you have no sins? Does that mean you're a victim and not guilty? What does it mean in terms of the big categories of life? Does that mean that gravity is imaginary? That you saw this Chinese guru? Do you see what I mean? Ask questions. Invite the person to think, I had this experience and it was a strong experience and I'm excited about this experience. And you all meet people, oh, I saw this, this happen, and that happen, and people get really excited about it, and it excites in some way their faith. And they put the faith of their life in some experience that they've had, but someone needs to bless them by asking, so what? Perhaps not in exactly those words. <laughs> those are pretty strong words to to ask more gently with a few more words, perhaps. But the basic meaning is, so what? What does this tell us about life? What, what did you learn from that? That would be a gentle way of asking. You saw the Chinese guru fly. Fine. 
What did you learn about life from that? Did you learn anything about yourself? Did it inspire a hope in your life that is a blessing? Do you hope to fly? And if you would fly, what would that mean? Would that mean your sins are forgiven? Would that mean you would get straight teeth? <laughs> or would, what would it mean if, if you would fly? Would that mean that um, the universe is a machine? Or would that mean, what, what would it mean if you would fly? Do, do you see how that works? Okay, I'm, I'm saying the word meaning very often. What does meaning mean? It's, it seems to me that fundamentally meaning means relationships. For instance, the meaning of the color red is not in the color red. It is in its relationship with blue and green. That is its meaning. It doesn't have any meaning in itself. If meaning means relationships, it means nothing has meaning in itself. It only has meaning in its relationships with what is outside itself, which would be purpose, explanation. Those are all relationships. So the, the ground is relationships, which is not foreign to the biblical worldview, <laughs> if you see what I mean, because it starts with relationships. The meaning of Adam was pointedly not in Adam. It was in his relationship with God and with Eve. Then he had meaning. Then on the mega level, the meaning of Jesus Christ is not in Jesus Christ. It is in his relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit. So nothing, including the, the persons of God, have meaning in itself. Meaning is relationships. You can say significance, signo facto, to make a sign, but the meaning of the sign is that it's read, so that is a relationship. You, you make a sign and somebody reads it and it's, it's a relationship. So meaning is relationship, and, and that, having that discussion with people can really lead a person to the idea that, re, that reality is fundamentally relational and not mechanical or energetic, which opens up one of the basic categories of the Bible, a reality to them. Encourage straight and adequate answers. Look for some form of yes or no, and be very unhappy, especially in your own speech, with the word whatever. The road to hell is paved with whatever. People make a statement and end it with whatever, which means I am uncommitted, irresponsible, and don't quote me. It's, uh, I, <laughs> you can't hold me to this. This isn't my meaning. This isn't my truth, whatever. Well, whatever. I mean, Jesus said, be hot or cold. If you're lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. If you are whatever... It's, it's over. See, I, that's a paraphrase. <laughs> but <clears throat> but it's, and I think it really connects with the thing. Yes or no. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything else comes from evil. Be hot or cold. If you're, if you're whatever, I spit you out of my mouth. So this is pretty strong. And a lot of Christians, of course, have to take it seriously because whatever has come into the church because the world is the salt and the light of the church. The world is the salt and the light of the church. Jesus said it differently. In, in Matthew 5, 6, 7, he said, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. That's what he said. That's what he meant. That's what he wants. But the fact is, beginning about two weeks after the resurrection, the world became the salt and the light of the church, even before. When Jesus appeared to the disciples in the room, the world of Platonism had salted their minds and their hearts, and they thought he was a transcendental spirit. 
they did not have the biblical categories, incarnational resurrection categories, in their minds and their hearts. They had been salted and lit by the categories of the Platonic world, the Greek world in which they lived. So this process began right away and continued. And we know this because all the letters in the New Testament are fighting Platonism and Gnosticism because they were in the church. So the categories of the world, salt and light the church, osmos into the church in every generation, and in our generation, one of the things that has salted the church is whatever. Whatever. Just, you see, if, if it is whatever, I'm not responsible, I'm not guilty, I'm just a victim. Everything is free, there is no form. It's a form of salvation. It, it is the false gospel of whatever. And many people you meet, including in the mirror, are living to, to lesser or greater extent in the gospel of whatever. I am saved by whatever, because in whatever I am not guilty. But this is a false gospel. And if you ask a few questions, you can help a person to realize, oh, this gospel is really false. Maybe I should look for another one. And then you will have blessed that person. They will become poor in spirit. But if they're rich in whatever, they cannot be blessed. You start to get the, the picture. This, this is categorics. This is not specifically apologetics. This is more categorics, but it's very similar to, to apologetics. Don't allow pragmatic ethical considerations or moral absolute considerations to be separated from each other in the discussion. So I'm saying that ideas that are wonderful and attractive and transcendental have to be connected with how does it work. And things working, being instrumental, have to be connected with big ideas so that all reality holds together. Jesus said also in the Sermon on the Mount, in chapter 6, he has this, these three sections that form a unit. The first section and the third section are about <laughs> separations, division. Don't lay up treasure on earth, lay up treasure in heaven. You cannot serve two masters. You will hate the one and you will love the other. So those are two dichotomies, two separations, two tensions. And then in the middle, it's a chiasm, it's a mini chiasm. In the middle is the connecting tissue. And it says, if your eye, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is, and all the modern translations say, good, healthy, sound, then your body is full of light. But the, the Greek word is single, which King James has. If your eye is single, but that's so shocking because you think you're a cyclops or something that people have come to more user-friendly words like good or sound or healthy. But the word is single. If your eye is single, your body is full of light. That means if you see reality through the Jesus glasses as all fitting together and not being divided into spiritual and secular or transcendental and imminent, if you see it all of reality held together by the word of the blood of Jesus Christ, your eye is single and your body is full of light because you see truly, you see how reality actually is, undivided, held together by Jesus Christ. But in various ways, everybody sees reality as divided. That can be a great blessing to people to ask them questions that can lead them to the possibility of understanding reality as undivided. What a wonderful healing process that is. Let your eye be single. And this third point, the pragmatical ethical considerations and the transcendent absolute philosophical considerations have to fit together work for that. In your own life, starting, always be prepared, so you have to do your, your homework, but then asking questions of the people that God calls you to love and to serve to help them to, to let their eye be single and to see reality as holding together. Because if we divide reality, 
we keep half of it and throw away the other half. Like the people in Colossians that Paul was so angry with. And he said that people had had visions of angels, and he didn't doubt it. They, he, they really had visions of angels. But their unspiritual minds puffed them up with idle notions because they thought that a supernatural experience of a vision of an angel was more spiritual and more real than baking bread or changing diapers. And so they were cut off from Christ. That's strong. They were cut off from the head of the church, who is Christ, because they divided reality and threw half of it away. And Jesus came to unite reality, to solve the dichotomy and the distinctions, and to, to bring the kingdom of heaven down onto the earth as he taught us to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. We pray those words, but we have in our heart, oh dear Jesus, get us out of here. <laughs> Jerk us out of here to a better place. That's what we really want. But that's not what those words say. They say, bring a better place here and let us pray and work that all of reality would be united, that heaven and earth would come together, as it speaks about in Revelation. The heavenly city comes down to the earth. And it's not a matter of dividing the church from the world, but having the church be in the world as salt and light. We have to exhibit that so that people will see the truth in our lives, in our communities, in our institutions. They will see the truth. In John's first letter in chapter 4, he says, no one has ever seen God. But if you love each other, God, who is love, becomes perfect, which means manifest, total, complete. So he's actually saying, no one has ever seen God, but if you love each other and people see you love each other, they see God. Which is a pretty big opportunity for us. You know, it's a, rather a great privilege. I can make God visible. That's better than a magic trick. This, this is really, a, if you see what I mean. I can make God visible. Whoa, what a power in life. But I don't because I'm so stupid and lazy and rebellious and selfish, you know, all these horrible things that I am. I don't make God visible, and I could make God visible. So that would be an apologetic, make God visible. Don't be swept away by experiences or phenomenon, levitation, sensation, speaking in tongues, healing, mind reading, etc., which you find in various places, but ask questions. Ask, so what? How does that fit together with everything else? Take time and care to have the same meaning for terms of the people that you talk to. So if someone says, Lord, you must ask, which Lord? Lord Buddha, Lord Krishna, Lord Jesus, what are we talking about? Or Love. What is love? Love means you never have to say you're sorry. Love means a warm, fuzzy feeling in the night. Love means a smiley face. Love means a teddy bear. Love means an emotion. Love means soft music. Well, none of those are the Bible's <laughs> definition of love. Again, in John chapter, first chapter, first letter, chapter four, he says, Love is an atoning sacrifice. That is what love is. It's not an emotion. It's a relationship of sacrifice. And most people, when they say love, they mean attraction, appetite, emotion, something like that, which, which things are not unreal or false, but they're not love. So we need to ask, what, what is love? And then really talk about it. And it can be a long conversation. What do you think love is? And then ask questions until the categories start to open up in their minds. And they begin to realize, well, I never really thought about this. 
I find over and over again as I talk with people, I ask questions like that, and people are disarmed, and they say, that's a very good question. And I always say, thank you. Because I take it as a great compliment that a non-Christian would say to me, that is a very good question, I think. Ah, oh, we've really connected. I have blessed this person, and they know it. And they acknowledge, you know, that is a very good question. Praise the Lord. It's a very good question. Work on your questions to ask people and, and bless them. And we, as Christians with each other, we don't ask what words mean. They become buzzwords. They don't become meaningful words or communicative words. So people say anointed, spirit-filled, various things like that. And we never want to know what it means. We just go and everyone goes together and we feel good. And we all sort of metaphorically hold it and we get higher and higher. And so because it feels good, we say it again. We say anointed and it always works. So then we just say it like a mantra. This is anointed, that's anointed, anointed, anointed. Everyone gets higher and higher and we just have a great time together. But we lose truth, you see. It's a, it's a huge sacrifice for the trip. It's like a drug trip. And we, we have this huge loss, but we need to slow down and ask, what are we talking about? So what? What does this mean? Not when I say <coughs> certain phrases, my Christian club members get higher. I'm not against having a good time and feeling good and feeling united. I'm not against that. I think it's important. Sing a good song together and have the experience together and feel the unity of the community and do it, do it. It's great stuff. But don't destroy language in order to have that good feeling, which, which is a huge temptation because it feels so good. I mean, to do that is the equivalent of... It feels so good, I can't stop. <laughs> <clears throat> it's, yeah, don't smoke linguistic dope. Speak. <laughs> Be clear. <laughs> because the first thing we know about God is that he speaks. And if we destroy language, what is our attitude toward God? Have we blessed him? Have we worshipped him? No. We have tried to destroy him, which we'll never manage to do. We only hurt ourselves. But if, if God speaks, and he is responsible for his speech, and his speech has uh, meaning and uh, production, and we are in his image, we are the same. We have to be careful about our language. It doesn't mean we shouldn't enjoy our language, but we shouldn't use it as a drug. Encourage consistency and continuity of categories throughout the discussion from day to day and from minute to minute. So if someone says spirit and you realize they mean one thing and then 10 minutes later they say spirit and you realize they mean quite a different thing, then you need to ask that. You need to ask for some continuity and say, well now, is this a different kind of spirit, or did I miss something on the way, or I thought you meant this by spirit, but now do you mean this by spirit? Do they both mean spirit? If we would draw a big circle, and inside the circle is spirit, and outside the circle is not spirit, would both those things fit in the circle? Then it might be a really big circle, but that's okay, as long as it's stable. But if the circle moves all the time, we don't know what we're talking about. We, we can't really communicate. There's no faithfulness. So ask for consistency and continuity of categories. If someone says love and they mean appreciation, I love your hairstyle or I love your shirt or, or something like that. And then five minutes later, love means sex. And then five minutes later, love means emotion or uh, exclusivity of relationship. Well, those are three very different things. And love might mean all of them, but then we need to be clear and, and to have categories of communication.
gently and with respect. Look for both verifiability and falsifiability in worldview claims, which means most Christians are aware of certain verifiabilities of Christianity, but we can begin to have faith in faith. I was in a debate in uh, Switzerland at a, a large, very exclusive private school, very expensive, and the chaplain of the school organized a debate between the, the chief Müller of Geneva, the chief rabbi of the rabbinical school in Bay, Udo Middleman, who was a Presbyterian pastor, and I agreed to be a Zen Buddhist. Although I was a Christian at the time, I used to be a Zen Buddhist monk, and I said, I will represent Zen Buddhism in the debate, which I thought I could honestly do. <laughs> so, <clears throat> the, there was one question, and we would each answer the question. We had five minutes. How do you know that God exists? And the Mullah spoke for three or four minutes, and basically he said, I know that God exists, and if you don't know it, I will kill you. <laughs> so then, thank you, Muhammad, thank you very much. And then, <laughs> then it was the rabbi's turn, and he said, I know that God exists because I believe in him so strongly that he must exist. Which means he produces God by his faith threw it all away. There is no God. I am God. The strength of my belief produces God. Do you see how that works? I mean, do you see how that doesn't work? <laughs> and, and Udo just went, <laughs> it was just horrified. I sat like a Zen Buddhist and didn't, <laughs> didn't blink. And then Udo had... Udo is a great teacher, but his teaching comes like a Mississippi River, and it just <laughs> flows. And so five minutes was just torture for him. And he, he doesn't really clear his throat in five minutes. And he, he did the best he could, and it was good and clear. I thought, good, Udo, good, Udo, because he was my friend. And then it was my turn. And I said, I do not know that God exists, and I do not know anything else. <laughs> And the applause began and rose like a tsunami and filled the hall. And so, very sadly, I won the debate <clears throat> as a Zen Buddhist. So you, you have to be careful. And then I said at the end, I am allowed to say, I am actually a Christian, but I've represented Zen Buddhism. And several people complained that it was dishonest that the debate was dishonest, even though I won. <laughs> I thought, oh, what do you do? What do you do? <laughs> I mean, you can't, you can't defend yourself against such an accusation. You won, but you cheated. Well, how did you cheat? Well, you know, you should have lost. Well, I don't know. It was, it was very difficult. I became a Christian for a variety of reasons, but one of the main reasons was it takes less faith to believe in Christianity than to believe in anything else, which means all other beliefs are more religious than Christianity. And that's a very important thing to remember in apologetics or categorics, is I very often say to people who express their views to me, well, I understand what you say and I respect it, but I don't want to be that religious. Because I agree with Karl Marx, religion is the opiate of the people, and I'm very suspicious of it, and I, I just think you're, you're too religious, it makes me nervous. And if you say that to an atheist, it's a bit surprising. <laughs> <laughs> Why? You're nervous because I'm too religious? Yeah, yeah because um, I, I have thought it through, and I have chosen the understanding of reality that it seems to me requires the absolutely least faith of all of them, and what you're talking about makes some pretty big leaps of faith. So, for instance, um, 
I was at a conference in Gdańsk in Poland a few years ago, and there was a bunch of scientists. And they wanted me to talk about epistemology, because I'm no scientist, but, but I could do epistemology with them. And one lecturer, was, his lecture was called, In the Beginning Was Information. And he said, most scientists who are atheists, especially biologists, believe in information. No one will deny that information exists. And on the genetic level, everyone agrees information controls matter. But there is no evidence that matter produces information. So there are two possible hypotheses. One, which I think takes the least faith and is the most reasonable hypothesis, is information is supernatural, which would be the biblical view. The other hypothesis, which I think is more religious, is to say we believe that it will eventually be demonstrated and discovered how matter produces information, and which would be the atheist uh, approach, which is much more religious than Christian. And then I would say, ah, oh, you're too religious, I just can't buy into that. I, I don't want to have that much faith. I would rather work more with fact than with faith, and your, your faith is just too big. You have to say that gently with respect, but you have to say it. I, I kind of work in two directions. I try to, be, to speak biblically, but not speak evangelicalese. <laughs> and then sometimes I speak evangelicalese, but not biblically. I, I actually try to translate myself constantly. And I think one of, one of our labors of love is to translate ourselves. So I teach homiletics. And I, I have the students present a sermon, and then I say, okay, good, good sermon. Now, translate this into a three-minute message for six-year-olds. And they just tear their hair. Because the work is so hard to do that. And most of them totally fail the first effort. But it's so worth it to translate. Translate this for an agnostic truck driver who never graduated from high school. Hard work, but it can be done. But Jesus did it. Jesus had a, a huge vocabulary, but he translated himself for the people that he was speaking to so that he would connect with them. And sometimes I think we should use surprising words like, like Jesus did when the rich young ruler came and said, good teacher, what must I do to be saved? He used a category. He said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Am I God or am I not good? What do you think? Well, this is really in your face. You see, this is really, am I God or not? You call me good, you mean God? Then I think we have a mandate from the Lord to work like that to serve, to think what are their categories, and how are they mixed up, and what could I ask that would help them to clarify. That's, you see, that's precisely what Jesus was doing. You say good, what does good mean? You're a Jew, you know only God is good. Am I God? What, what are you saying? And that's a huge but very healthy confrontation. And we have to do it gently and with respect. But it's, it precipitates a crisis, a paradigm shift for people. But that's absolutely necessary for salvation, to, to have a paradigm shift. So I would say be constantly working with the language and don't, don't always use your favorite word. So I, I'm writing a book about epistemology. I've been preaching for 35 years. I have never said the word epistemology from the pulpit in any church. It's my favorite word. But I try to discipline myself a little bit, and because if I would say epistemology from the pulpit, it would be a turnoff. I would lose the congregation immediately. You just mustn't do it. Epistemology is a really good word. So, and you, and you have to wrestle with it and know what it means and know what you mean and know historically and etymologically and a variety of dictionaries. And that gives you data, but truth is not fact. 
Truth is fact plus meaning, and meaning means relationships. So that's how I wrestle with terminology. I looked for the facts, and then I try to make the facts have meaning in relationship, which transforms the facts into living truth. Does that make sense to work like that? Yeah, I, I look for the facts, and then I transform the facts by putting them in meaningful relationships which means that the, the truth is more than fact. It's fact plus meaning. So the fact is contextualized and recontextualized in the meaning of relationships. And you don't lose the fact, but you're, you're not enslaved by the fact. You're, you're not only in form, you also live in freedom. Then, then it's a lively life. Then you have lively apologetics. And then when, you, when you're not only living in fact, you can more easily relate with gentleness and respect to a person. But if you say, I know the facts and you don't, that's just polemical. That's just uh, patronizing. And it's probably alienating. But if you, if you work and you let them see you work and you invite them to work with you as a human being, it, it can be good. Do not answer questions that have not been asked, but help people to find and articulate their questions. So maybe we only have a couple of minutes. I could end with a, with a story. I was in Holland. 30 years ago, lecturing, and I was coming home to Switzerland on the train. And it was a corridor train with compartments. And there was a man by the window, and I was by the corridor, and a woman on the opposite bench. And we stopped in Arnhem. And the woman got up and got off. And because we were European, we spoke to her. We said, good night, have a good evening. And because it was an international train, we spoke English. Then the guy said, do you know what time it is? I said, yes, it's 10.30. And when he spoke to me, I was reading the Bible. So I closed the Bible and I slipped it down between me and the corridor wall so that he would not see what I was reading and be prejudiced against me. I am not ashamed of the Bible, but I don't parade it around all the time. Look what I'm reading, because it's very alienating. And people make lots of really unhelpful assumptions about me if they see I'm reading the Bible. So I, I hid it. And I said, oh, it's 10.30. And he said, if, if I'm asleep when we get to Colne at midnight, would you wake me up? I said, yeah, I'm reading. I'll probably be awake. I can do that. You live in Colne? No, I live in Rotterdam. Oh, well, what do you do in Rotterdam? I'm a professor of economics. I said, oh. I don't know anything about economics. Could I ask you a question about economics? I said, sure. What is economics? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, the students never ask us this. I said, well, I'm really ignorant, and so I have to start from the beginning. He said, okay, economics is the exchange of goods and services between peoples. And I thought that sounded pretty good. And subsequently, economists have told me if he said that, he is a professor of economics, because there's no better short answer than that. So I felt, I'm really with the guy who knows. So I said, could I ask you a more naive question? He said, well, I don't know. <laughs> I said, well, I ask it, and if it's a stupid question you tell me, we talk about something else. Okay. If economics is the study of the exchange of goods and services between peoples, what is this basic unit of your study? What is a person? And he looked at me, and he banged his head against the back of the compartment really hard. And I said, oh, uh, maybe it's a stupid question. We talk about something else. And he said, we must answer. And I said, over to you. <laughs> so 
very intelligent man, he, sa he started to talk about sociology and psychology and anthropology and geography and typography and weather and climate and agriculture and transportation and I mean he really was talking about a lot of things trying to say what a person is and then he said and then you need to bring in God and I said God why <laughs> you see my technique you ask questions. You, <laughs> you ask questions. You just say, oh, the man says, God, he must be a brother. Praise the Lord. And hug him. No, wait, wait, hold on. <laughs> you, know, you want to know which God? What are we talking about? What God? Why? He said, well, you need an overarching category to contain all the other categories and give them meaning. And I said, oh, that makes sense. I can see that. But now, is this God that you talk about really there? Or do you invent him to contain your categories? And he said, that is the question. <laughs> <clears throat> and then we, we pulled into Colm. And he said, well, what do you do? I said, well, I do this for a living. I have conversations with people about God. And he said, I thought so. <laughs> so. We got into this very quickly. And then we exchanged cards, and we corresponded for a while after that. And he got up, and he shook my hand, and he said, I want to thank you for the most interesting conversation I have ever had about economics. <laughs> And my point is, I don't know anything about economics. I know something about asking questions. And this professor of economics really felt blessed in his own subject by a totally ignorant Christian. Well, now all of you probably qualify as a totally ignorant Christian in various areas. Take courage. Be bold. Go out there and bless people in your ignorance. And, and trust God to empower you to do that. And I think you will see some very interesting things.